It's that time of year again. Let's take a look at the 10 best JRPGs of 2023, starting with Fuga Melodies of Steel 2. Now this is the follow-up to the 2021 hidden gem released this year, and I bet a lot of you didn't even know it came out. And a lot of you might be asking yourself, well, why did I not know it came out? Well, it released the same week as Zelda, like who else was going to buy another game that same week? And it's more or less the same game, but that formula is pretty incredible, so I'll take more of that same kind of game. Now, of course, there are plenty of new features and a rather gripping story. Here in Fuga 2, there's an ominous character that seems to be mind-controlling a lot of the children, and you have to go and save them. In terms of the core gameplay loop, it remains fairly the same. You get in the tank and you follow a pretty linear path, getting into battles, healing your tank, picking up items, and then culminating with a big fight at the end. However, something new that they added were decisions during conversations, and depending on how you answer those questions, that'll dictate where on a meter you'll go one way or another. And depending on how far down one side of the meter you get, you'll get new abilities in battle. Now, I particularly love games that have a variety of gameplay, so you're not constantly doing the same thing over and over again. And here in Fuga, I love that it's constantly changing things up. You could be fighting battles, but then you can get off and go dungeon crawling to find treasures. You can get into town and talk to people. There's such great pacing in whatever you're doing, and I always wanted to keep playing and get to the next part of the game. I really enjoyed the first Fuga game, and as I got back into the game loop of this one, I found myself falling in love all over again. I know there were a ton of great games that came out this year, but please, if you forgot that this game came out or you didn't even know it came out, go back and pick it up on a sale or just buy it at full price because it's definitely worth it. Now, one game that I did not expect to play this year and certainly didn't expect to love as much as I did was Like a Dragon Ishin. Now, admittedly, I'm not the biggest Yakuza fan. I haven't played a ton of those games, but there was something about this one that I really dug. Now, this is a remake of a 2014 title of the same name, but this remake includes a lot of new character models, lighting, and much more. It's basically a what-if story taking place in 1860s Japan, using the likeness of characters from the modern Yakuza games, or I guess now it's Like a Dragon. Now, you'll end up doing a lot of the same activities like getting into fights, karaoke, and countless other side activities. There were so many things that kept me busy that I would just mess around for hours completely ignoring the main missions. And weirdly enough, one of my favorites was fishing. I don't know what it was about fishing, but I just absolutely loved the little mini game that went with it. And there was also this side quest about this guy who was a fisherman and you had to help him out by giving him fish so he didn't fail as a man, I guess. So that was a lot of fun. And I also loved the various combat styles, but my absolute favorite had to be the Wild Dancer, where you had a gun in one hand and a sword in the other. And it's funny that they call it the Wild Dancer because it really felt like you were doing dance moves. You were constantly swirling around and doing different poses. It just felt super fun. And for me, visuals and setting can go a long way when it comes to my enjoyment of a game. And I personally love the Edo era of Japan. I think that aesthetic is just so cool. So I'd be lying if I said that it didn't do a lot of heavy lifting and why I like the game so much. Either way, it's an excellent game worth every cent and it's one you should definitely check out. Now, Nayu to Boundless Trails isn't going to win any awards this year, but it's a game right up my alley that I really enjoyed. Now, a lot of us thought this was a game that was going to be lost to Japan forever because it was only on PSP in Japan, but it finally got a beautiful remaster and fully localized in English thanks to NIS America. But for me, what I really enjoyed was the game's game loop. Nayuta is a stage-based RPG. Basically, you'll go into a level, you'll explore it, fight enemies, collect treasures, and then eventually, maybe three levels down, you'll fight a boss. But what's cool is once you complete a zone, you'll be able to change the seasons of that zone and go back to the same levels and replay them all over again in a whole new way. And what I love is that levels are never too long, maybe like 10 minutes tops. So that makes for some really great pacing and it makes you feel like you're always moving forward and always progressing. Now, once you complete levels, you could just keep going with the story and go to the next level, fight the boss, go to the next story bit, but then you could always go back to town and partake in side quests and other activities. Now, side quests are pretty much like kill 10 of these things or collect this thing in one of the zones, but one of my favorite activities was contributing to the local museum. You know, as you explore the levels and fight monsters and pick up items, you'll find things like bugs and flowers and different things like that, and you can contribute them to the museum, very much like the museum in Animal Crossing. And what's cool is you can actually walk around the exhibits as they open up and as you fill them up, so it feels extra satisfying that way. Now, this game was made by Falcom, famous for the Ease games, and while the combat isn't quite as tight as Ease, it still feels really good. And what I also loved about Nayuta is that it clocks in at around 20 hours, and for $40, to me, that is the perfect sweet spot. I'm sure this game fell through the cracks for a lot of people in a very crowded year, but if you haven't given it a go yet or you didn't know it came out, definitely give it a try, especially if you like Ease games. 
Now, one of the most highly anticipated JRPGs going into 2023 was Sea of Stars. Now, for me personally, it didn't totally live up to the hype, but it's still a really good game. One look at it and you can tell that it's a classic throwback style JRPG, very reminiscent of games like Chrono Trigger. It has this gorgeous pixel art style, like every single detail from the animations to the designs of the characters looks incredible. It has turn-based combat with timing elements, a la Super Mario RPG that are super fun. Some really intuitive level design where you always know where to go next, along with some pretty clever puzzles. And it does have a story that, while not great, is good enough to pull you along to make you want to see what happens next. For me personally, I felt like not having voice acting hurt it just a little bit, but I understand that they probably wanted to stick with that classic 16-bit design and not have voice acting. But what I think Sea of Stars does so well is it weaves all its systems together super well from everything from how short the levels are, but are also cleverly designed so you know where you're supposed to go next. It gives you different items that mesh with combat really well, and it just never feels grindy because there's only so many enemies you can fight in each level, so you're always at the appropriate level. It's always just about your strategy in combat. That said, I do feel like they could have added a few more abilities to combat because by the end of the game it felt really stale like I was doing that like moon boomerang ability from the very beginning all the way to the end of the game so it would have been nice if they added just a few more of those. That said this is definitely one of the best JRPGs of 2023 and will probably win best indie game at the game awards and by the time this video comes out we'll probably know if they won or not. Not to mention it's a great value for only $35 for a game that'll take you probably 30 to 40 hours to finish. So if you like retro throwback JRPGs this is one you shouldn't miss. Now, if you've been following my channel for any period of time, you know that I love tactical RPGs and I was thrilled when Persona 5 Tactica was revealed, but is it any good? Oh, you bet your sweet little cheeks it's good. What Tactica gets right that so many other tactical RPGs get wrong is the length of battles. So many tactical RPGs get bogged down with these insanely long levels, and if you mess up at any point, you have to start all the way over again, and it's such a kick in the teeth. But Persona 5 Tactica's levels are just the right length. You see the goal, you see what you're supposed to do with each level, just execute your strategy and get out. Levels are never longer than like maybe 10 or 12 minutes outside of boss fights. To me, that just felt like the perfect length, and by the time I finished each battle, it just felt really satisfying and I couldn't wait to get to the next one. And to delve even further, there's side quests that feel more like mini puzzles. For example, it'll ask you to defeat every enemy on the map in one turn, which can get a little tricky, but it was fun to kind of figure those out. That said, the mechanics aren't super deep, but that's almost the strength of the game because it's not how deep the mechanics are, but it's how you utilize those mechanics that makes Persona 5 Tactica feel so satisfying to play. Now, I know a lot of people think that Persona 5 is already way past milk to death, and I probably agree with them, but I love seeing these characters in this kind of game with a more chibi art style. It was really fun and stylish. Now, personally, I didn't really vibe with the story as much as I would have hoped I would have, but there's plenty of fun moments that make it worth sitting through. Especially those cutscenes, they're so well animated and well executed, they were just a joy to watch. Now, whether you've never played a tactical RPG before or you're a veteran, this is the perfect for any player. You can make it as easy as you want, or you can really crank the difficulty and make it more challenging. Either way, this is definitely a game you need to check out if you haven't already. Now, let me preface this segment by saying I've never played the original Super Mario RPG before, but I was super excited to dive into this remake. And man, this game has charm oozing out of every corner, from the visuals, the sound effects, to the music. Oh my god, the music is so good from composer Yoko Shimomura. I feel like playing this game without the sound is borderline criminal because it transforms the game in a massive way. And what I love about Super Mario RPG is that it's a very streamlined game. You always know where you're supposed to go next. I mean, the world is almost laid out like a Mario game with the overworld and the little dots connecting each level. And levels themselves are fairly linear, although of course there are ways to explore and find extra secrets. And this remake of course brings back the timing-based turn-based combat. You'll have to hit buttons right before you land your attack or right before an enemy attacks you so you can block it and either reduce the damage or get no damage taken to you. And the remake, I believe, adds a ton of new features like this action gauge that gives you buffs the higher the meter gets, and when it's totally full you can do triple attacks. And what's really cool is those triple attacks change depending on who's in your party, and it was really fun to swap out characters to see what those attacks would be. I guess you could say Super Mario RPG is straightforward, but really fun. The battles never lasted too long, and overall it just has really great pacing. I loved my time with Super Mario RPG, and I can see why it's considered one of the best retro JRPGs. And it's great that it's been so lovingly remade for a modern audience so more people can enjoy it. 
Now, I know for a lot of people, it's going to be sacrilegious to put Eternites over Super Mario RPG, but hey, when have I ever had normal tastes for games? Now, I have to say that I'm a huge fan of the modern Persona games and their formula, and Eternites very obviously was inspired by those games. And to me, it did a great job of putting its own spin on the formula. Basically, this is Persona with action combat, and it has a very Persona-like loop. Once you get past the tutorial, you'll have to defeat a boss by a certain calendar date or the game ends. Now, one complaint I know some people have with the Persona games is that the calendar system can feel very constrictive. However, here in Eternites, everything is very lenient. Sometimes you have like a week to fight the boss, but you could probably get to them in like one day if you really power through it. Now, the combat is interesting. It is action-based, but it almost has a rhythm game-like element to it with the timed button presses and other quick time events. It sounds annoying, but it actually gives combat a really cool flow to it. There's also this perfect dodge mechanic that if you dodge at just the right time, it slows down the combat and you can just wail on enemies. And this becomes increasingly important as the game goes on because certain enemies can't even be damaged if you don't get a perfect dodge off. Now, once you're out of combat, you have tons of free time to hang out with friends, go on dates, learn more about characters, scavenge for items, and increase stats. To me, this is just a really satisfying game loop, especially if you love Persona. But I think what makes this game really special and why it's so high up for me was the cast of characters. They all felt really relatable in different ways. I mean, they had really different personalities, and I just wanted to get to know all of them, even though the cast overall is not that big. And in a busy year with a ton of great games, I love that this only takes about 10 to 12 hours to finish. That said, there is a lot of replay value in Eternites because who you choose at the end of the game to date or be with drastically changes the end of the game, so you could replay the game many times over and have drastically different outcomes. That said, there are a few minor issues like healing came at a premium because you would run out of MP really quick and there's no healing items. And also the game juxtaposed to your really bright arm is super dark. So at times it was really hard to see what was going on on the screen. Overall though, I felt like Eternites was an excellent game, a great first outing for a one person studio. And I can't wait to see what they do next. If it's not clear already, I'm a huge fan of tactical RPGs, and Fire Emblem Engage was one of the very best I've played in recent memory. Admittedly, the story is weak compared to Three Houses, probably the best game in the Fire Emblem franchise, but it's great where it counts. It's gameplay. It brings back really interesting level designs where positioning actually matters. It's not just about hitting enemies with your strongest troops until the battle's over, you have to actually implement tactics and strategy. And I love this game's gimmick, the Engage mechanic. Basically, you can pair up any normal character with a past Fire Emblem character to create some unique abilities. And what's fun about this is that it creates exciting moments in the middle of battle and it can really turn the tide of battle. And I feel like there's a really good balance with these abilities because you can only really use them once per fight with each character, maybe two if the battle's really long. And it was also really fun trying different combinations with different characters to see what would happen. Now, I know people hate on Aaliyah's design. They're calling her like Toothpaste Chan or Pepsi Girl or whatever. But overall, I really like the art style of this game. It's very crisp. It looks super nice. And it looks especially good for being a Switch game. This is arguably one of the best looking Switch games in my opinion. And for those that can't get enough, there was tons of DLC release with extra characters and scenarios. Now, it might have been forgotten because it released so early in the year, but this is definitely one of 2023's best games. I recently finished Star Ocean The Second Story R and absolutely fell in love with it. Of course, the thing that catches your attention right away is that gorgeous art style, putting its own spin on the HD 2D art style that was made famous from Octopath Traveler and Triangle Strategy. It took my breath away every time I visited a new town. I just loved exploring every little nook and cranny to see what the game would have for me. It also had a really compelling story with tons of fun characters, and what's really cool is you can actually miss out on some of the characters depending on what choices you make, so it gives you a lot of incentive to replay the game choosing different characters. This game added so many quality of life design choices like asking if you want to equip the new gear that you just bought, being able to fast travel all over the world, this new ability where you can call in party members in the middle of fights, and other various skills that you can earn throughout the game. Now early on I felt like it was really easy, like I could beat enemies in one hit, but as the game went on it kind of found a nice balance. Especially near the end some of the bosses got really difficult and I had to kind of swap out party members to accommodate the fight, so I really liked that the game asked me to do that. Now what really holds it back from being number one on this list were some really bad dungeons. There's one where you step on these teleporting platforms and it's kind of hard to figure out where you're going to go next. And there's another one where you're constantly like turning on and off these colored switches. I genuinely almost quit the game at those points because they were so annoying. However, I'm glad I powered through those because the game is excellent overall. I'm really glad that I finished it. I genuinely think every RPG fan should play it. But that only leaves one game to take the crown as JRPG of the year.
In my opinion, Octopath Traveler 2 runs away with being the best JRPG of 2023. In a lot of ways, it's pretty much the same game, but also improves on the first game dramatically. It retains that same incredible visual style and dynamic turn-based combat, but slightly refines both. Now there's a really cool day-night cycle that makes for some gorgeous scenes at night, particularly with lanterns and anytime you're in water. Also, this game released on other consoles besides the Nintendo Switch on day one, so now we can enjoy it in glorious 60 frames per second. The combat system also added a new special ability for each character that adds a whole new dynamic twist. But to me, I think the biggest improvement is the writing. More of the characters have interesting stories that you want to see to the very end. In the first game, there was maybe only half of them that I really cared about, but here it was almost all of them. They also added more opportunities for characters to actually interact with each other, which was pretty cool. Personally, my favorite stories were Throne, Agnia, and Hikari. I couldn't wait to see how they all ended. With Throne, it was that dark story of revenge, and it was really heartbreaking, but really compelling. I loved Hikari's story of redemption, trying to get back his kingdom, but of the three, I think Agnia was my personal favorite. I'm a sucker for those heartwarming, sweet stories, and I love that she was trying to live up to her mother and be a big star, and I just thought that whole story was really, really sweet. Now, some people complain that the story still doesn't really tie in better overall, and I can understand that complaint, but for me, I just didn't care. I love that Octopath Traveler 2 lets me pick the stories I want to engage with, and if I'm not feeling one, I don't have to finish it. It's great. I can just pick the ones I want to engage with, and each story on its own is maybe like six to 10 hours for each character, so if I want to do all of them, I can, but again, if I don't, then I don't have to. I seriously hope they keep making Octopath Traveler games forever because I can't get enough of them. So those are my favorite JRPGs of 2023, but what were some of your favorites? Let me know in the comments below. And if you want to know some of the worst JRPGs of 2023 that you should avoid, make sure you check out this video right here. And special thanks to Reset Switch, Tyler Kuzava, and the Miyazaki Man for supporting me over on Patreon. To get exclusive videos and other cool perks, consider supporting me over on patreon.com slash thegamingshelf. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.